The Governor-General of Canada is the federal viceregal representative of the Canadian monarch, currently Queen Elizabeth II. Because the person of the sovereign is shared equally both with the fifteen other Commonwealth realms in the ten provinces of Canada and resides predominantly in her oldest realm, the United Kingdom, she, on the advice of the Canadian Prime Minister, appoints the Governor-General to carry out most of her constitutional and ceremonial duties. The commission is for an unfixed period of Timi a Euro known as serving at Her Majesty's plea jury a Euro though five years is the normal convention. Beginning in 1959, it is also traditional to rotate between Anglophone and Francophone incumbents. Once in office, the Governor-General maintains direct contact with the Queen, wherever she may be at the time. The office has its roots in the 16th and 17th century colonial governors of New France and British North America, and thus is the oldest continuous institution in Canada. The present incarnation of the position emerged with Canadian Confederation and the British North America Act in 1867, which defined the viceregal office as the Governor-General acting by and with the advice of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada. However, the post still ultimately represented the government of the United Kingdom until, after continually decreasing involvement by the British government and the passage in 1931 of the Statute of Westminster, the Governor-General became the direct personal representative of the uniquely Canadian sovereign. During that process of gradual independence, the Governor-General took on an ever-expanding role. In 1904, the Militia Act granted permission for the Governor-General to use the title of Commander-in-Chief of the Canadian Militia, in the name of the sovereign and actual Commander-in-Chief, and in 1927 the first official international visit by a Governor-General was made. In 1947, King George Virgin Islands U.S. issued letters patent allowing the viceroy to carry out almost all of the monarch's powers in his or her stead. By the Constitution Act, 1982, any constitutional amendment that affects the Crown, including the office of the Governor-General, requires the unanimous consent of each provincial legislature as well as the Federal Parliament. The current Governor-General is David Lloyd Johnston, who has served since October 1, 2010. Prime Minister Stephen Harper recommended him to succeed Michael Legeen. Johnston Sophia Euro, who is thus the viceregal consorti Euro as Sharon Johnston. Spelling of title, the Government of Canada spells the title Governor-General without a hyphen. The Canadian media still often use the Governor-General spelling. As Governor is the main noun in the title, it is the term that is pluralized. Thus, it is Governors General rather than governor-generals. Moreover, both terms are capitalized when used in the formal title preceding an incumbent's name. Appointment. The position of governor-general is mandated by both the Constitution Act, 1867, and the letters patent issued in 1947 by King George VI. As such, on the recommendation of his or her Canadian Prime Minister, the Canadian monarch appoints the Governor-General by commission issued under the Royal Sign Manual and Great Seal of Canada. That individual is, from then until being sworn in, referred to as the Governor-General designate. Besides the administration of the oaths of office, there is no set formula for the swearing in of a Governor-General designate. Though there may therefore be variations to the following, the appointee will generally travel to Ottawa they're receiving an official welcome and taking up residence at Seven Rideau Gate, and will begin preparations for their upcoming role, meeting with various high-level officials to ensure a smooth transition between Governors General. The Sovereign will also hold an audience with the appointee and will at the time induct both the Governor General designate and his or her spouse into the Order of Canada as companions, as well as appointing the former as a commander of both the Order of Military Merit and the Order of Merit of the Police Forces. The swearing-in ceremony begins with the arrival at Seven Rideau Gate of one of the Ministers of the Crown, who then accompanies the Governor-General designate to Parliament Hill, where a Canadian Forces Guard of Honour awaits to give a general salute. From there, the party is led by the Queen's Parliamentary Messenger a Euro the Usher of the Black Road a Euro to the Senate Chamber, wherein all Justices of the Supreme Court, Senators, Members of Parliament, and other guests are assembled. 
the Queen's commission for the Governor-General-designate is then read aloud by the Secretary to the Governor-General and the required oaths are administered to the appointee by either the Chief Justice or one of the Puissant Justices of the Supreme Court. The three oaths are, the Oath of Allegiance, the Oath of Office as Governor-General and Commander-in-Chief, and the Oath as Keeper of the Great Seal of Canada. With the affixing of their signature to these three solemn promises, the individual is officially the Governor-General, and at that moment the flag of the Governor-General of Canada is raised on the Peace Tower, the Viceregal salute is played by the Central Band of the Canadian Forces, and a 21-gun salute is conducted by the Royal Regiment of Canadian Artillery. The Governor-General is seated on the throne while a prayer is read, and then receives the Great Seal of Canada, as well as the chains of both the Chancellor of the Order of Canada and of the Order of Military Merit. The Governor-General will then give a speech, outlining whichever cause or causes he or she will champion during his or her time as Viceroy. The incumbent will generally serve for at least five years, though this is only a developed convention, and the Governor-General still technically acts at Her Majesty's pleasure. The Prime Minister may therefore recommend to the Queen that the Viceroy remain in her service for a longer period of time, sometimes upwards of more than seven years. The Governor-General may also resign, and two have died in office. In such a circumstance, or if the Governor-General leaves the country for longer than one month, the Chief Justice of Canada serves as Administrator of the Government and exercises all powers of the Governor-General. Equals Selection Equals in a speech on the subject of Confederation, made in 1866 to the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Canada, John A. Macdonald said of the planned governor, We place no restriction on Her Majesty's prerogative in the selection of her representative. The sovereign has unrestricted freedom of choice. We leave that to Her Majesty in all confidence. However, between 1867 and 1931, Governors General were appointed by the monarch on the advice of the British cabinet. Thereafter, in accordance with the Statute of Westminster 1931, the appointment was made by the sovereign with the direction of his or her Canadian ministers only. Until 1952, all Governors General were also either members of the peerage or sons of peers, and were born beyond Canada's borders. These viceroys spent a relatively limited time in Canada but their travel schedules were so extensive that they could learn more about Canada in five years than many Canadians in a lifetime. Still, though all Canadian nationals were as equally British subjects as their British counterparts prior to the implementation of the Canadian Citizenship Act in 1947, the idea of Canadian-born persons being appointed Governor-General was raised as early as 1919, when, at the Paris Peace Conference, Canadian Prime Minister Robert Borden consulted with Prime Minister of South Africa Louis Botha and the two agreed that the vice-regal appointees should be long-term residents of their respective dominions. Calls for just such an individual to be made viceroy came again in the late 1930s, but it was not until Vincent Massey's appointment by King George Virgin Islands U.S. in 1952 that the position was filled by a Canadian-born individual. Massey stated of this that a Canadian, as Governor-General makes it far easier to look on the Crown as our own and on the Sovereign as Queen of Canada. This practice continued until 1999, when Queen Elizabeth II commissioned as her representative Adriana Clarkson, a Hong Kong-born refugee to Canada. Moreover, the practice of alternating between Anglophone and Francophone Canadians was instituted with the appointment of George Isbania, a Francophone who succeeded the Anglophone Massey. All persons whose names are put forward to the Queen for approval must first undergo background checks by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. Although required by the tenets of constitutional monarchy to be non-partisan while in office, Governors-General were frequently former politicians. A number held seats in the House of Lords by virtue of their inclusion in the peerage. Appointments of former ministers of the Crown in the 1980s and 1990s were criticized by Peter H. Russell, who stated in 2009, much of the advantage of the monarchical system is lost in Canada when prime ministers recommend partisan colleagues to be appointed governor-general and represent the Queen. Clarkson was the first governor-general in Canadian history without either a political or military background, as well as the first Asian Canadian and the second woman following on Jeanne Sauver copyright. 
the third woman to hold this position was also the first Caribbean Canadian Governor General, Michael Legene. There have been, from time to time, proposals put forward for modifications to the selection process of the Governor General. Most recently, the group Citizens for a Canadian Republic has advocated the election of the nominee to the Queen either by popular or parliamentary vote. A proposal echoed by Adriana Clarkson, who called for the Prime Minister's choice to not only be vetted by a parliamentary committee, but also submit to a televised quiz on Canadiana. Constitutional scholars, editorial boards, and the Monarchist League of Canada have argued against any such constitutional tinkering with the vice regal appointment process, stating that the position being not elected is an asset, not a handicap, and that an election would politicize the office, thereby undermining the impartiality necessary to the proper functioning of the Governor-General. A new approach was used in 2010 for the selection of David Johnston as Governor-General-designate. For the task, Prime Minister Stephen Harper convened a special search group a Euro the Governor-General Consultation Committee a Euro was instructed to find a non-partisan candidate who would respect the monarchical aspects of the vice-regal office and conducted extensive consultations with more than 200 people across the country. In 2012, the committee was made permanent and renamed as the Advisory Committee on Vice-Regal Appointments with a modified membership and its scope broadened to include the appointment of provincial lieutenant governors and territorial commissioners. Role As Canada shares its monarch equally with 15 other countries in the Commonwealth of Nations, the sovereign has 10 other legal personas within the Canadian Federation, and the sovereign lives predominantly outside Canada's borders. The Governor-General's primary task is to perform the monarch's federal constitutional duties on his or her behalf. He or she acts within the principles of parliamentary democracy and responsible government as a guarantor of continuous and stable governance and as a non-partisan safeguard against the abuse of power. For the most part, however, the powers of the Crown are exercised on a day-to-day -day basis by elected and appointed individuals, leaving the Governor-General to perform the various ceremonial duties the Sovereign otherwise carries out when in the country. At such a moment, the Governor-General removes him or herself from public, though the presence of the monarch does not affect the Governor-General's ability to perform governmental roles. Past Governor-General the Marquess of Lorne said of the job, It is no easy thing to be a Governor-General of Canada. You must have the patience of a saint, the smile of a cherub, the generosity of an Indian prince, and the back of a camel, and the Earl of Dufferin stated that the Governor-General is a representative of all that is august, stable and sedate in the government, the history, and the traditions of the country. Incapable of partisanship, and lifted far above the atmosphere of faction. Without adherence to reward or opponents to oust from office. Docile to the suggestions of his ministers, and yet securing to the people the certainty of being able to get rid of an administration or parliament the moment either had forfeited their confidence. Equals constitutional role equals. Though the monarch retains all executive, legislative, and judicial power in and over Canada, the Governor-General is permitted to exercise most of this, including the royal prerogative, in the sovereign's name. Some as outlined in the Constitution Act, 1867, and some through various letters patent issued over the decades, particularly those from 1947 that constitute the office of Governor-General of Canada. They state, and we do hereby authorize and empower our Governor-General, with the advice of our Privy Council for Canada or of any members thereof or individually, as the case requires, to exercise all powers and authorities lawfully belonging to us in respect of Canada. Amongst other duties, however, the monarch retains the sole right to appoint the Governor-General. It is also stipulated that the Governor-General may appoint deputies a Euro usually Supreme Court Justices and the Secretary to the Governor-General a Euro, who can perform some of the Viceroy's constitutional duties in his or her stead, and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court will act as the Administrator of the Government upon the death, removal, incapacitation, or absence of the Governor-General for more than one month. It is the Governor-General who is required by the Constitution Act, 1867, to appoint for life persons to the Queen's Privy Council for Canada, who were all theoretically tasked with tendering to the monarch and viceroy guidance on the exercise of the royal prerogative. Convention dictates, though, 
that the Governor General must draw from the Privy Council an individual to act as Prime Minister Euro in almost all cases the Member of Parliament who commands the confidence of the House of Commons. The Prime Minister then directs the Governor General to appoint other Members of Parliament to a committee of the Privy Council known as the Cabinet, and it is in practice only from this group of Ministers of the Crown that the Queen and Governor General will take direction on the use of executive power. An arrangement called the Queen in Council or, more specifically, the Governor in Council. In this capacity, the Governor General will issue royal proclamations and sign orders in Council. The Governor in Council is also specifically tasked by the Constitution Act, 1867, to appoint in the Queen's name the Lieutenant Governors of the Provinces, Senators, the Speaker of the Senate, Supreme Court Justices, and Superior and County Court Judges in each province except those of the courts of probate in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. The advice given by the Cabinet is, in order to ensure the stability of government, typically binding. Both the Queen and her Viceroy, however, may in exceptional circumstances invoke the reserve powers, which remain the Crown's final check against a ministry's abuse of power. The Governor-General alone is also constitutionally mandated to summon Parliament. Beyond that, the Viceroy carries out the other conventional parliamentary duties in the Sovereign's absence, including reading the speech from the throne and baroguing and dissolving Parliament. The Governor-General also grants royal assent in the Queen's name. Legally, he or she has three options, grant royal assent, withhold royal assent, or reserve the bill for the signification of the Queen's pleasure. If the Governor-General withholds the Queen's assent, the Sovereign may within two years disallow the bill thereby annulling the law in question. No modern Canadian viceroy has denied royal assent to a bill. Provincial viceroys, however, are able to reserve royal assent to provincial bills for the Governor-General. This clause was last invoked in 1961 by the Lieutenant Governor of Saskatchewan. Equal ceremonial role equals. With most constitutional functions lent to Cabinet, the Governor-General acts in a primarily ceremonial fashion. He or she will host members of Canada's royal family, as well as foreign royalty and heads of state, and will represent the Queen and country abroad on state visits to other nations, though the monarch's permission is necessary, via the Prime Minister, for the Viceroy to leave Canada. Also as part of international relations, the Governor-General issues letters of credence and of recall for Canadian ambassadors and receives the same from foreign ambassadors appointed to Canada. The Governor-General is also tasked with fostering national unity and pride. One way in which this is carried out is traveling the country and meeting with Canadians from all regions and ethnic groups in Canada, continuing the tradition begun in 1869 by Governor-General the Lord Lysgar. He or she will also induct individuals into the various national orders and present national medals and decorations. Similarly, the Viceroy administers and distributes the Governor-General's awards, and will also give out awards associated with private organizations, some of which are named for past governors general. During a federal election, the governor general will curtail these public duties, so as not to appear as though they are involving themselves in political affairs. Although the Constitution of Canada states that the Command-in-Chief of the Land and Naval Militia, and of all naval and military forces, of and in Canada, is hereby declared to continue and be vested in the Queen, the Governor-General acts in her place as Commander-in-Chief of the Canadian Forces and is permitted through the 1947 Letters Patent to use the title Commander-in-Chief in and over Canada. The position technically involves issuing commands for Canadian troops, airmen, and sailors, but is predominantly a ceremonial role in which the Viceroy will visit Canadian Forces bases across Canada and abroad to take part in military ceremonies, see troops off to and return from active duty, and encourage excellence and morale amongst the forces. The Governor-General also serves as Honorary Colonel of three household regiments, the Governor-General's Horse Guards, Governor-General's Foot Guards and Canadian Grenadier Guards. This ceremonial position is directly under that of Colonel-in-Chief, which is held by the Queen. Since 1910, the Governor-General was also always made the Chief Scout for Canada, which was renamed Chief Scout of Canada after 1946 and again in 2011 as Patron Scout. Residences and Household Rideau Hall in Ottawa is, 
as the residence of the monarch, the official residence of the Governor-General and is thus the location of the Viceroyal Household and the Chancellery of Honours. The Governor-General's wife is known as the Sheikh Lane of Rideau Hall, though there is no equivalent term for a Governor-General's husband. For a part of each year since 1872, Governors-General have also resided at the Citadel in Quebec City, Quebec. The viceregal household aids the Governor-General in the execution of the royal constitutional and ceremonial duties and is managed by the Office of the Secretary to the Governor-General. These organized offices and support systems include aide-de-comp, press officers, financial managers, speechwriters, trip organizers, event planners, protocol officers, chefs and other kitchen employees, waiters, and various cleaning staff as well as visitors center staff and tour guides at both official residences. The Chancellery of Honours also centers around the Queen and is thus administered by the Governor-General, whose secretary simultaneously holds the position of Herald Chancellor of Canada and, as such, oversees the Canadian heraldic authority Euro the mechanism of the Canadian honours system by which armorial bearings are granted to Canadians by the Governor-General in the name of the Sovereign. In this official and bureaucratic capacity, the entire household is often referred to as Government House. These departments are funded through the normal federal budgetary process, as is the Governor-General's salary of CAD $134,970, which will be taxed as of 2013. Additional costs are incurred from separate ministries and organizations such as the National Capital Commission, the Department of National Defense, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The Governor-General's air transportation is assigned to 412 Transport Squadron of the Royal Canadian Air Force. The squadron uses Bombardier Challenger 600 VIP jets to transport the Governor-General to locations within and outside of Canada. Symbols and Protocol As the personal representative of the monarch, the Governor-General follows only the sovereign in the Canadian Order of Precedence, preceding even other members of the royal family. Though the federal viceroy is considered primus inter pairs amongst his or her provincial counterparts, the governor-general also outranks the lieutenant governors in the federal sphere. At provincial functions, however, the relevant lieutenant governor, as the queen's representative in the province, precedes the governor-general. The incumbent governor-general and his or her spouse are also the only people in Canada, other than serving Canadian ambassadors and high commissioners. Entitled to the use the style his or her excellency and the Governor-General is granted the additional honorific of the right honorable for their time in office and for life afterwards. Prior to 1952, all Governors-General of Canada were members of the peerage. Typically, individuals appointed as Federal Viceroy were already a peer either by inheriting the title, such as the Duke of Devonshire, or by prior elevation by the Sovereign in their own right, as was the case with the Viscount Alexander of Tunis. None were life peers, the Life Peerages Act 1958 postdating the beginning of the tradition of appointing Canadian citizens as Governor-General. John Buchan was, in preparation for his appointment as Governor-General, made the Baron Tweed Smear of Ellsfield in the County of Oxford by King George V, six months before Buchan was sworn in as Viceroy. The leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition at the time, William Lyon Mackenzie King, felt Buchan should serve as Governor-General as a commoner. However, George V. insisted he be represented by a peer. With the appointment of Vincent Massey as Governor-General in 1952, Governors-General ceased to be members of the peerage. Successive governments since that date have held to the non-binding and defeated principles of the 1919 Nickel Resolution. Under the Order's constitutions, the Governor-General serves as the Chancellor and Principal Companion of the Order of Canada, the Chancellor of the Order of Military Merit, and the Chancellor of the Order of Merit of the Police Forces. He or she also upon installation automatically becomes a Knight or Dame of Justice and the Prior and Chief Officer in Canada of the Most Venerable Order of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem. As Acting Commander-in-Chief the Governor-General is further routinely granted the Canadian Forces decoration by the Chief of the Defence Staff on behalf of the monarch. All of these honours are retained following an incumbent's departure from office, with the individual remaining in the highest categories of the orders, and they may also be further distinguished with induction into other orders or the receipt of other awards. 
the viceregal salutio euro composed of the first six bars of the royal anthem followed by the first and last four bars of the national anthem a euro is the salute used to greet the governor general upon arrival at and mark his or her departure from most official events to mark the viceroy's presence at any building ship airplane or car in canada the governor general's flag is employed the present form was adopted on february 23 1981 and in the federal jurisdiction, takes precedence over all other flags save the Queen's personal Canadian standard. When the Governor General undertakes a state visit, however, the national flag is generally employed to mark his or her presence. This flag is also, along with all flags on Canadian forces property, flown at half mast upon the death of an incumbent or former Governor General. The crest of the Royal Arms of Canada is employed as the badge of the Governor General appearing on the viceroy's flag and on other objects associated with the person or the office. This is the fourth such incarnation of the Governor-General's mark since Confederation. History equals French and British colonies equals, French colonization of North America began in the 1580s and Emma de Chaste was appointed in 1602 by King Henry IV as Viceroy of Canada. The explorer Samuel de Champlain became the first unofficial governor of New France in the early 17th century, serving until Charles Hurault de Montmagny was in 1636 formally appointed to the post by King Louis XIII. The French Company of 100 Associates then administered New France until King Louis XIV took control of the colony and appointed Augustin de Safray de Mar copyright S.Y. as the first governor-general in 1663 after whom twelve more people served in the post. With the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1763, France relinquished most of its North American territories, including Canada, to Great Britain. King George III then issued in that same year a royal proclamation establishing, amongst other regulations, the office of the Governor of Quebec to preside over the new province of Quebec. Nova Scotia and New Brunswick remained completely separate colonies, each with their own governor, until the cabinet of William Pitt adopted in the 1780s the idea that they, along with Quebec and Prince Edward Island, should have as their respective governors a single individual styled as governor-in-chief. The post was created in 1786, with the Lord Dorchester as its first occupant. However, the governor-in-chief directly governed only Quebec. It was not until the splitting in 1791 of the province of Quebec, to accommodate the influx of United Empire loyalists fleeing the American Revolutionary War, that the King's representative, with a change in title to Governor-General, directly governed Lower Canada, while the other three colonies were each administered by a Lieutenant Governor in his stead. Equals responsible government equals, the rebellions of 1837 brought about great changes to the role of the Governor-General, prompting, as they did, the British government to grant responsible government to the Canadian provinces. As a result, the viceroys became largely nominal heads, while the democratically elected legislatures and the premiers they supported exercised the authority belonging to the Crown. A concept first put to the test when an 1849 Governor-General of the Province of Canada and Lieutenant Governor of Canada East the Earl of Elgin granted royal assent to the Rebellion Losses Bill despite his personal misgivings towards the legislation. This arrangement continued after the reunification in 1840 of Upper and Lower Canada into the province of Canada, and the establishment of the Dominion of Canada in 1867. The Governor-General carried out in Canada all the parliamentary and ceremonial functions of a constitutional monarch a euro amongst other things, granting royal assent, issuing orders in council, and taking advice from the Canadian Privy Council. However, the governor still remained not a viceroy, in the true sense of the word, being still a representative of and liaison to the British government a Euro the Queen and her British Council of Ministers a Euro, who answered to the Secretary of State for the Colonies in London and who, as a British observer of Canadian politics, held well into the First World War a suite of offices in the East Block of Parliament Hill. But, the new position of Canadian High Commissioner to the United Kingdom created in 1880, began to take over the Governor-General's role as a link between the Canadian and British governments, leaving the Viceroy increasingly as a personal representative of the monarch. As such, the Governor-General had to retain a sense of political neutrality. 
a skill that was put to the test when the Marquess of Lorne disagreed with his Canadian Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald, over the dismissal of Lieutenant Governor of Quebec Luke Letelier de Street Just. On the advice of the Colonial Secretary, and to avoid conflict with the Cabinet of Canada, the Marquess did eventually concede, and release Street Just from duty. The Governor-General of Canada was then in May 1891 called upon to resolve the Dominion's first cabinet crisis, wherein Prime Minister Macdonald died, leaving the Lord Stanley of Preston to select a new Prime Minister. As early as 1880, the viceregal family and court attracted minor ridicule from the Queen's subjects. In July of that year, someone under the pseudonym Captain Mack included in a pamphlet called Canada, From the Lakes to the Gulf a coarse satire of an investiture ceremony at Rideau Hall, in which a retired innkeeper and his wife undergo the rigorous protocol of the royal household and sprawl on the floor before the Duke of Argyle so as to be granted the knighthood for which they had paid in cold, hard cash. Later, prior to the arrival of Prince Arthur, Duke of Connaught and Strathairn, to take up the post of Governor-General, there was a feeble undercurrent of criticism centering on worries about a rigid court at Rideau Hall. Worries that turned out to be unfounded as the royal couple was actually more relaxed than their predecessors. Equals emerging nationality to an independent kingdom equals. During the First World War, into which Canada was drawn due to its association with the United Kingdom, the Governor-General's role turned from one of cultural patron and state ceremony to one of military inspector and morale booster. Starting in 1914, Governor-General Prince Arthur donned his field marshal's uniform and put his efforts into raising contingents, inspecting army camps, and seeing troops off before their voyage to Europe. These actions, however, led to conflict with the Prince's Prime Minister at the time, Robert Borden. Though the latter placed blame on the military secretary Edward Stanton, he also opined that the Duke laboured under the handicap of his position as a member of the royal family and never realised his limitations as Governor-General. Prince Arthur's successor, the Duke of Devonshire, faced the conscription crisis of 1917 and held discussions with his Canadian Prime Minister, as well as His Majesty's loyal opposition members, on the matter. Once the government implemented conscription, Devonshire, after consulting on the pulse of the nation with Sir Wilfrid Laurier, Vincent Massey, Henri Bourassa, Archbishop of Montreal Paul Bratcher Copyright C, Duncan Campbell Scott, Bill Jarmer Stephenson, and Stephen Leacock, made efforts to conciliate Quebec, though he had little real success. Canada's national sentiment had gained fortitude through the country's sacrifices on the battlefields of the First World War and, by war's end, the interference of the British government in Canadian affairs was causing ever-increasing discontent amongst Canadian officials. In 1918, the Toronto Star was even advocating the end of the office. The Governor-General's role was also morphing to focus less on the larger empire and more on uniquely Canadian affairs, including the undertaking of official international visits on behalf of Canada, the first being that of the Marquess of Willingdon to the United States, where he was accorded by President Calvin Coolidge the full honours of representative of a head of state. It would be another decade, however, before the King buying affair, another catalyst for change in the relationship between Canada a Euro indeed, all the dominions a Euro, and the United Kingdom, and thus the purpose of the Governor-General. In 1926, Liberal Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King, Facing a non-confidence vote in the House of Commons over a scandal in his party, requested that Governor-General the Lord Byng of Vimy dissolve Parliament and call an election. Byng, however, refused his Canadian Prime Minister's advice, citing both the facts that King held the minority of seats in the House and that a general election had been held only months earlier. He thus called on Arthur Mygen to form a government. Within a week however, Mygen's Conservative government lost its own non-confidence vote, forcing the Governor-General to dissolve Parliament and call elections that saw Mackenzie King returned to power. King then went on to the Imperial Conference that same year and there pushed for reorganizations that resulted in the Balfour Declaration, which declared formally the practical reality that had existed for some years, namely, that the Dominions were fully autonomous and equal in status to the United Kingdom. These new developments were codified in the Statute of Westminster, through the enactment of which on December 11, 1931, Canada, 
along with the Union of South Africa and the Irish Free State, immediately obtained formal legislative independence from the UK. The Governor-General thus became solely the representative of the King within Canadian jurisdiction, ceasing completely to be an agent of the British Cabinet, and as such would be appointed by the monarch granting his royal sign manual under the Great Seal of Canada only on the advice of his Canadian Prime Minister. The Canadian Cabinet's first recommendation under this new system was still, however, a British subject born outside of Canada, the Lord Tweedsmew. His birthplace aside, though, the professional author took further than any of his predecessors the idea of a distinct Canadian identity, travelling the length and breadth of the country, including, for the first time for a Governor-General, the Arctic regions. Not all Canadians, however, shared Tweedsmew's views. The Baron raised the ire of imperialists when he said in Montreal in 1937, a Canadian's first loyalty is not to the British Commonwealth of Nations, but to Canada and Canada's King, a statement the Montreal Gazette dubbed as disloyal. During Tweedsmew's time as Viceroy, which started in 1935, calls began to emerge for a Canadian-born individual to be appointed as Governor-General. But Tweedsmew died suddenly in office in 1940, while Canada was in the midst of the Second World War, and Prime Minister Mackenzie King did not feel it was the right time to search for a suitable Canadian. The Earl of Athlone was instead appointed by King George Virgin Islands U.S., Athlone's nephew, to be his viceroy for the duration of the war. Equals Quebec nationalism and constitutional patriation equals, it was in 1952, a mere five days before King George Virgin Islands U.S.'s death, that Vincent Massey became the first Canadian-born person to be appointed as a Governor-General in Canada since the Marquis de Vaudreuil Cavagnol was made Governor-General of New France on January 1, 1755, as well as the first not to be elevated to the peerage since Sir Edmund Walker Head in 1854. There was some trepidation about this departure from tradition and Massey was intended to be a compromise, he was known to embody loyalty, dignity, and formality, as expected from a viceroy. As his viceregal tenure neared an end, it was thought that Massey, an Anglophone, should be followed by a Francophone Canadian. And so, in spite of his Liberal Party attachments, George's Vania was chosen by Conservative Prime Minister John Diefenbaker as the next Governor-General. Vania was subsequently appointed by Queen Elizabeth II in person at a meeting of her Canadian cabinet, thus initiating the convention of alternating between individuals from Canada's two main linguistic groups. This move did not, however, placate those who were fostering the new Quebec nationalist movement, for whom the monarchy and other federal institutions were a target for attack. Though Vania was a native of Quebec and fostered by culturalism, he was not immune to the barbs of the province's sovereigntists and, when he attended La Fartie Street Jean Baptiste in Montreal in 1964, a group of separatists held placards reading Vania Vendu and Vania Fou de Lorraine. In light of this regional nationalism and a resultant change in attitudes towards Canadian identity, images and the role of the monarchy were cautiously downplayed, and Vania's successor, Roland Michener, was the last viceroy to practice many of the office's ancient traditions, such as the wearing of the Windsor uniform, the requirement of court dress for state occasions, and expecting women to curtsy before the Governor-General. At the same time, he initiated new practices for the viceroy, including regular conferences with the lieutenant governors and the undertaking of state visits. He presided over Canada's centennial celebrations and the coincidental Expo 67, to which French President Charles de Gaulle was invited. Michener was with de Gaulle when he made his infamous Vive la Quai copyright Beck Lieber speech in Montreal and was cheered wildly by the gathered crowd while they booed and jeered Michener. With the additional recognition of the monarchy as a Canadian institution, the establishment of a distinct Canadian honour system, an increase of state visits coming with Canada's growing role on the world stage, and the more prevalent use of television to visually broadcast ceremonial state affairs, the Governor-General became more publicly active in national life. The Cabinet in June 1978 put forward the Constitutional Amendment Bill C-60, that, amongst other changes, vested executive authority directly in the Governor-General and renamed the position as First Canadian, but the proposal was thwarted by the provincial premiers. 
When the Constitution was patriated four years later, the new amending formula for the documents outlined that any changes to the Crown, including the office of the Governor General, would require the unanimous consent of all the provincial legislatures plus the federal parliament. By 1984, Canada's first female Governor General Euro Jeanne Sauve v Euro was appointed. While it was she who created the Canadian heraldic authority, as permitted by letters patent from Queen Elizabeth II, and who championed youth and world peace, saw the copyright proved to be a controversial viceroy in, closing to the public the grounds of the Queen's residence and self-aggrandizingly breaching protocol on a number of occasions. Equals Withering and Renaissance equals, Sarah, Duchess of York, said in 2009 that sometime during her marriage to Prince Andrew, Duke of York, her husband was offered the position of Governor-General of Canada, and she speculated in hindsight that their agreement to refuse the commission may have been a contributing factor in their eventual breakup. Instead, saw the copywriter's tenure as Governor-General was bookended by a series of appointments of Euro Edward Schreyer, Ray Nate Shine, and Roma copyright Ola Blanca Euro that have been generally regarded as mere patronage postings for former politicians and friends of the incumbent Prime Minister at the time, and despite the duties they carried out, their combined time in the viceregal office is generally viewed as unremarkable, at best, damaging to the office, at worst. As David Smith described it, notwithstanding the personal qualities of the appointees, which have often been extraordinary, the Canadian Governor-General has become a hermetic head of state a Euro ignored by press, politicians and public. It was theorized by Peter Boyce that this was due, in part, to widespread misunderstanding about the Governor-General's role coupled with a lack of public presence compared to the media coverage dedicated to the increasingly presidentialized Prime Minister. It was with the Queen's appointment of Adriana Clarkson, on the advice of then Prime Minister Jean Crick copyright 10 that a shift in the office took place. Clarkson was the first Canadian viceroy to have not previously held any political or military position a Euro coming as she did from a background of television journalism with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation a Euro was the first since 1952 to have been born outside of Canada, the first from a visible minority, and, by her being accompanied to Rideau Hall by her husband, author and philosopher John Ralston Saul. The official appointment brought an unofficial pair to the viceregal placement, in that the Governor-General would not be the only person actively exploring Canadian theory and culture. Clarkson managed to bring the viceregal office back into the collective consciousness of Canadians, winning praise for touring the country more than any of her predecessors, her inspiring speeches, and her dedication to the military and her role as the Commander-in-Chief's representative. This did not come without a cost, however, as the attention also drew widespread criticism of the Governor-General's increased spending on state affairs, for which the office was symbolically rebuked by Parliament when it voted in favour of cutting by 10% the viceregal budget it had earlier supported, as well as for fostering the notion, through various demonstrations, that the Governor-General was ultimately the Canadian head of state above the Queen herself an approach that was said by Jack Granitstein to have caused a fury with the Queen on one occasion in 2004. This attitude was not unique to Clarkson, though. It had been observed that, for some decades, staff at Rideau Hall and various government departments in Ottawa had been pushing to present the Governor-General as head of state, part of a wider liberal policy on the monarchy that had been in effect at least since the proposed constitutional changes in the 1970s if not the 1964 tranche and Saturday riot in Quebec City. Indeed, international observers opined that the viceroys had been, over the years, making deliberate attempts to distance themselves from the sovereign, for fear of being too closely associated with any Britishness the monarch embodied. Prime Minister Paul Martin followed Crick Copyright Ten's example and, for Clarkson's successor, put forward to the Queen the name of Michael Legeen, who was, like Clarkson, a woman, a refugee, a member of a visible minority, a CBC career journalist, and married to an intellectual husband who worked in the arts. Her appointment initially sparked accusations that she was a supporter of Quebec sovereignty, and it was observed that she had on a few occasions trodden into political matters, as well as continuing to foster the notion that the Governor-General had replaced the Queen as head of state, thereby unbalancing the Federalist symmetry. But Jean ultimately won plaudits, p. 
particularly for her solidarity with the Canadian forces and Canada's Aboriginal peoples, as well as her role in the parliamentary dispute that took place between December 2008 and January 2009. With the appointment of David Johnston, a lifelong academic and former University of Waterloo president and vice-chancellor, there was a signalled emphasis for the Governor-General to vigorously promote learning and innovation. Johnston stated in his inaugural address, We want to be a society that innovates, embraces its talent and uses the knowledge of each of its citizens to improve the human condition for all. There was also a recognition of Johnston's expertise in constitutional law, following the controversial prorogations of Parliament in 2008 and 2009, which initiated some debate about the Governor-General's role as the representative of Canada's head of state. Activities post-commission, retired Governors-General usually withdraw from public life or accept diplomatic postings. Edward Schreyer, for instance, was appointed Canadian High Commissioner to Australia upon his departure from the vice role in 1984, and Michael Legine became the UNESCO Special Envoy to Haiti. Schreyer did also, however, become the first former Governor-General to run for elected office in Canada when he vied for a seat in the House of Commons as a Member of Parliament for the New Democratic Party. He did not win the riding. Prior to 1952, several former viceroys returned to political careers in the United Kingdom, sitting with party affiliations in the House of Lords and, in some cases, taking a position in the British Cabinet. An outgoing Governor-General may leave an eponymous award as a legacy, such as the Stanley Cup, the Clarkson Cup, or the Grey Cup. Others may also or instead found an institution, as George's Vania did with the Vania Institute of the Family and Adriana Clarkson's Institute for Canadian Citizenship. Three former Governors-General have released biographies, the Lord Tweetsmew, Vincent Massey, and Clarkson. Canadian institutions established by Governors-General, Royal Society of Canada Euro the Marquis of Lorne, Canada's first anti-tuberculosis association a Euro the Earl of Minto, the Battlefields Park a Euro the Lord Grey, King's Jubilee Cancer Fund a Euro the Earl of Bessborough, Vania Institute of the Family a Euro George's Vania, Sauver Copyright Foundation a Euro Jean Sauver Copyright. Governor General Ramon John Nati Shine Education Fund a Euro Ray Nati Shine, International Council for Canadian Studies a Euro Ray Nati Shine, the Nati Shine Foundation a Euro Ray Nati Shine, Institute for Canadian Citizenship a Euro Adriana Clarkson, Michael Legeen. Foundation a Euro Michael Legeen. See also Governor General's Awards List of awards presented by the Governor General of Canada, Royal Canadian Air Force VIP Aircraft, Governor General. Notes. References. Further reading, Cassiel, Irma. Canada's Prime Ministers, Governors General and Fathers of Confederation. Pembroke Publishers. ISBN 1 55138 185 0. External links. Official website of the Governor-General of Canada, YouTube channel of the Governor-General of Canada, Proclamation Constituting the Office of Governor-General and Commander-in-Chief of Canada.